All right, so you've decided to host your application in AWS, and now you've got a whole new set of choices to face. Do you want to use EC2 or Fargate or Lambda functions? Well, which one are you going to choose? Stick around and I'll tell you how to make that decision. Hey, I'm Will Button, and this is DevOps for Developers, where I teach you how to build, scale, and grow your application using DevOps principles, even if you don't have a DevOps team. Which, just as a side note, I'm actually not a fan of having a DevOps team, but that's a topic for another video we'll be recording in the future. So after evaluating all your options, you decided to go with AWS, and now you've got to figure out which tools in AWS you're going to use. By the way, if you're still evaluating whether or not you should be using AWS or GCE or Heroku or someone like that, I've got a video that I'll link here that can help you decide. So when you decide to go with AWS, you've got to pick the right tool, right? And the, I'm going to talk about three different options in this video. There's EC2 instances, uh, Fargate for Elastic Container Service, and then Lambda functions, also known as serverless. And we'll talk about the pros and cons of each. So we'll start with EC2 instances because that's by far probably the easiest way to get up and running. You know, you launch an EC2 instance with Linux or Windows, whichever operating system you're most familiar with, and then you'll push your code out to it, however you get there, and then you just, you know, you SSH into that server and you operate that just like you would your own local workstation. And it's kind of a very familiar environment for a lot of people. And it's really easy to do in AWS. You know, you just go to EC2 and you launch a new instance, tell it how much memory and that kind of stuff, and it's up and running in a few minutes. So while that's the easiest to get started, it's not the most scalable, right? So you're limited to a single EC2 instance whenever you do that, unless you go and add your own scaling and fault tolerance to a cluster of EC2 instances. And then when you get into scaling itself or auto scaling, um, auto scaling can be really, really challenging to someone who's not experienced with it. And even if you are experienced with it, it's not the fastest auto scaling in the world because once you reach this criteria where you decided it's time to auto scale, you've got to make the API calls, which provisions a new EC2 instance. That EC2 instance comes up to, up to speed. And then you've got to configure your application for it, which means getting your code on there, installing any different applications that your code requires, such as Node.js or Ruby on Rails or something like that. And you can actually save that off as an image and then just launch a new instance based off of that image. But then every time you update Ruby on Rails or update Node or update any of the dependencies, you have to go recreate that image and then go you know, change your auto scaling framework to point to the new image and things like that. So it's quick and easy to get started, works great for proof of concept stuff. I've actually seen a lot of production applications running this way, but it does have its challenges and its limits whenever you try to auto scale that or try to scale that out to meet the needs of a really, really large application. Now Lambda also is pretty easy to get up and running. You just create a new Lambda function and you just put your code on it and it takes off and it, it starts running. So that looks like it's pretty promising, right? Until you get into some of the finer details. For instance, um, you know, most of my experience is running web applications. So that's the example I'm going to use here. Um, a Lambda function can't be directly exposed to the internet. So then you've got to build an API gateway and define your routes and the routes point down to the Lambda function, which that's easy enough to do as well for most applications. You know, you're just a few button clicks away from it. And that's where I think the real problem lies, you know, is whenever you configure an application using button clicks and checkboxes, there's no way to reliably reproduce that. You know, to reproduce it, you have to click on the exact same buttons and checkboxes that you did the first time it was built, or you're going to get a different behavior. And the place that that normally comes back to bite you in the ass is if someone else goes in later, even if it's accidentally, and changes a setting in your existing configuration, it can alter the behavior of your application, but you're not going to know why, you know, unless someone remembers or takes the time and effort to point out that they made a change, 
you're just going to have your application behaving differently and spend a lot of time troubleshooting before you realize that it's changed because the configuration has changed. Now there are some tools that can help you deal with this. There's the whole serverless framework that configures everything for you and kind of you know packages everything as code so that you can track the configuration and the, the API gateway and the Lambda function itself are defined via code and so you get a little bit a little bit tighter integration there which is a really cool feature because lambdas actually themselves are pretty cool there's absolutely no server to deal with for executing your code and there's not even docker containers so you don't even have to figure out how to build your application into a docker container to get it run you just push your code up but you do have to have like a really tightly defined software deployment or software lifecycle process and make sure that your entire team follows it because at the end of the day for most applications anyone can go into the AWS console open up that lambda function and there's a built-in editor right there you can just start typing in new code directly into that lambda function and it may work you know we'll assume that you have really good developers on your team and then that does work but that change now has to make its way back into your source code repo and so you've got to discourage that practice across your team and make sure that people are following the proper development life cycle for that to happen and so that's that's another one of the risks of using lambda another limitation of lambda that can catch people off guard is it's pretty scalable and it's pretty performant but it does have concurrency limitations so it can only handle a certain number of requests um, by definition, you know, that's how AWS manages their billing for it. You're allowed a certain number of invocations and any beyond that you'll get throttled. And so what happens when you get throttled is a request will come in through your API gateway and then there's no available Lambda functions to serve it. So it's just going to stall there. And so the user experience for your client trying to use their service is just that your service is going to be non-responsive. And it's kind of a little bit of magic and takes some work to expose the right AWS metrics to see that that's actually what hap is that's actually what's happening. And so a lot of times, you know, if you didn't build that in up front, you know, it can create really mysterious behaviors in your application that take a while to track down. All said, though, you know, I think Lambda is a really cool way to go. Um, I still consider it to be a bit new you know a bit it's not quite cutting edge but it's still kind of new because there's not really a whole lot of documentation and not a lot of people who have paved the way to determine what's a solid bulletproof way to go to production with this and that's really what i look for for my customers before i'll put them on a production application because you got to remember the purpose of your business is not to play with the new tools and not to use cutting edge technologies but it's to deliver the product that your customers are paying you for and so whenever the technology you're using becomes the reason that your customers can't get the thing they paid for that's where i really don't like using a specific tool so the last one I'll talk about is Fargate, and I like Fargate a lot. I've actually used it to scale some really, really large applications. And the way Fargate works is it's kind of like, um, it's, a, it's a hosted Docker solution, right? So you'll build your application as a Docker container. You'll configure Fargate to run that container, and then you can set your, you know, your minimum and maximum number of containers for auto-scaling. And it's a really nice solution there. The things to look out for in Fargate is it's really, really easy to go into the GUI and point and click your way through to a running configuration. But just like I mentioned earlier, you know, the problem with point and click your way to infrastructure success is the fact that it's not a, it's not reproducible and someone has the potential to change it without the rest of the team knowing, introducing changes to your changes to your application that may result in different behaviors problems and all the kind of things that go along with that now you can build fargate solutions using um, cloud formation tools and then you get your infrastructure as code so it's documented in code it's reproducible changes to it are tracked and the next challenge for fargate becomes integrating with continuous integration, continuous delivery, because your software deployment lifecycle now looks like when you merge to master, you know, you have to build a Docker container. That Docker container gets pushed up to 
uh, an ECR registry in Amazon, and then that triggers the service restart, or you will trigger the service restart in your Fargate application to pull that new Docker container into production. So it takes a little bit of work and a little bit more effort to get that set up. So the challenges in setup are there, but the documentation as far as infrastructure's code and the reliability and you know the guaranteed um, operation of your service, I feel is a lot stronger in Fargate than it is in Lambda or in EC2 instances. Plus, one other benefit of Fargate, which comes up every once in a while, is vendor lock-in. And if you are concerned or want to know if you should be concerned about vendor lock-in, I did another video on that that I'll link down below. So you can check that out to see if vendor lock-in applies to you, if it's something you should be worried about. But using something like Fargate, you're just building your application into a Docker container. So if you ever go anywhere besides AWS, you can go to any provider that allows you to run and execute Docker containers. So that's kind of it in a nutshell. Um, EC2 instances, quick and easy to get started. I wouldn't recommend it for production unless you just kind of have to, you know, if that's what you got to do to get it out the door. Uh, Lambda, the serverless framework, I think is really, really cool. And there's some great tools bringing it to, you know, quality standards. Um, I don't know if it's quite ready for mainstream yet. So if you're going to choose the Lambda serverless route, make sure you have uh, some in-house expertise and the time for that expertise to spend making sure this is set up properly. And then Fargate, I think, is like the way to go for right now for everyone else. You'll spend a little bit of time configuring and building it to get it up and running right. But once you do, it operates great. It scales fabulously and you'll just have a great experience with it plus that added bit of security or you know, sense of confidence that you know you can run your application anywhere you can get a Docker container to launch. So that's all I got to say on that. If you have comments, questions, or things that I didn't cover in this video, leave them in the comments below. Love to hear from you, and I'll see you next time.